Let's pray. Father, we just come to your throne. Lord, we just thank you for all your goodness and all your grace. Lord, it's by grace that we're here this morning. And Lord, we just ask you to anoint your word. Lord, you, we ask you to let the hear. Those that have ears, let them hear. And Lord, we're just asking you to do a work in all of us, Lord. There's none exempt. There's none exempt. We just ask you that your grace just shed, just Lord, just pour out your grace upon us. Lord, we don't need justice. We need grace. And we just ask in the precious, precious name of Jesus. Amen. In 1829, there was a fellow named George Wilson, and he robbed a mail train. And in the course of robbing the train, he killed a clerk. He was caught, convicted, and sentenced to hang. Some friends, over a course of time, intervened on his part, and President Andrew Jackson gave this man a pardon. But when the pardon was delivered to George Wilson, he wouldn't receive it. So in confusion, knowing not what to do, they, they go back to the president, so he just turns it over to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court comes back and rules that a pardon is a piece of paper. And it's only in effect as long as there's one giving it in authority and one receiving it in subjection. And they said, you wouldn't think a man under the sentence of death would reject such an offer, but since he has, he'll hang. And George Wilson hung, and a pardon was laying on the desk of the sheriff. All he had to do was reach out and establish what was given to him. But because of stubbornness, he refused it, and he hung. Now, here lately, we've been talking a lot about stubbornness. And now I remember six, eight months ago, I told Brother Chet one morning, I seen kind of in a vision of an old prospector pulling his donkey, and the donkey sits down. And he's trying to pull this donkey. And this donkey is not going anywhere because he's stubborn. And I see a lot of, we, we minister a lot of people and I've had some things in my own life I realized the stubbornness I had to repent of. But they'll go so far with the Lord and they'll sit down. And they'll say, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. They'll go just so far and they'll stay right there in their sins. Well, when the Lord come down on Sinai, he delivered his laws to mankind. And these laws are absolute. And they apply justice equally to all. And I found out not too long ago that in the courtroom, the judge gives instructions to the jury. And they say, this courtroom is not a place of mercy and compassion. It's a place of justice, and we must apply it equally to all. That's the same with the law of God. So I want to talk about God's law today. And, and Jesus, in, in uh, Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Do not think that I came to abolish your law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill but truly I say to you, to heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter, nor stroke shall pass away from the law, until all is accomplished. And whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments, and so teaches others, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus established that he didn't come to this earth. He came as the pardon. But he didn't come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill the law. In Galatians 3.10, it 
says, For many are under the works of law or under a curse. For it is written, Curses everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices him shall live by them. And Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So Jesus come to fulfill the law. And then in Galatians 5.18, it says, If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. There's a statement made there. And then it goes down in, in uh, verse 22, it talks about the things that are of the Spirit. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, these are the things that are not under the law. When you walk in the peace and rest of the Lord, you're not under God's law. You've been justified. And the only way to walk there is being in Christ Jesus. And being in Christ Jesus is to obey Him. Obedience to Him. A lot of times what happens in, in, in religious circles and everything, we, we said some words 25 years ago, and we think we're justified to live in our sins. And we're stubborn. We can be stiff-necked. And what I realize religion does a whole lot is kind of like an old bulldog that wants to tear the pants off a mailman. And religion just puts a muzzle on him. And he can't tear the pants off a mailman, but in his heart he wants to. See, it moves from the outer man to the inner, the inner man. So we quit drinking and chewing and chasing. But we live in envy and strife and jealousy and bitterness and these things right here. And look what it says in uh, verse 19. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorceries, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger. Outburst of anger is under the law. Outburst of anger, disputes, dissension, fractions, envy, and drunkenness, crowds, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just I forewarn you, those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So a lawbreaker, now, God's law, when he come down on Sinai, he said his laws is absolute. And a man that does not walk under that law is under a sentence of hell. By the rule of God, it's set between him, a holy God has set his rule between him and mankind. So I'm telling you what, it, it's tough to walk under the law. It's killing us. Now, and, and John, uh, uh, but I'll give you an example. How many of you just walked into peace and the rest of the Lord? Boy, you just had peace like a river. How many have been there? It's a good place to be, isn't it? And then maybe you catch yourself in a telephone conversation or catch yourself doing something you should, and then all at once your heart gets condemned. How many have had that tap? You know what happened? Brother Chet put both hands up. I probably could too if I wasn't holding the microphone. I'm going to tell you what happens. When you're walking in that peace, you're walking in love, joy, it has nothing to do with sin here. We're talking about the heart. Well, you just want to please the Lord. See, then you get yourself caught in a, a conversation, maybe a little gossip or something, and then your heart starts condemning you. You know why your heart's condemning you? Because there, there stands God's law. See, the law stands to condemn you. And when it's standing there, and you're standing in that place of condemnation, what do you do? You run to your sacrifice, don't you? You say, Lord, boy, I've sinned. I, I've, I've gossiped or whatever what that sin be that condemned your heart. And then his blood is still flowing from Calvary. See, the pardon is still there, still laying on the desk of the sheriff. And we reach out and we, we, we grab his pardon. And he sees that's in our hand. We sees the blood. We get our peace back. How many have had that happen to you? After you repent, you get your peace back. See, and through that, what he does, that's how he guides us 
He guides us through that peace to cleanse us. I mean, you might be just burdened down with sin, and God's just dealing one little bit, little by little, as you become fruitful and take possession of the land. And then He'll deal with another sin, and that's how He washes you. But what happens? We we stop with Him. We stop. We come like that old donkey, and we put our feet out and make that declaration: "I am not going there." And what happens? There stands the law. The law of God. When we become stiff-necked, when we won't go on with the Lord, a lot of people will go so far, stop. Instead of making that declaration, devil, I am sick and tired. We heard a lady not too long ago say, I am sick and tired of what you're doing to me and my family. I am making a declaration, a proclamation. I'm going on with God. Look in uh, in First John three fourteen. It says we shall know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. He says hate your brother. He didn't say kill him. He says hate your brother. Look look in verse nineteen. We shall know by this that we are the truth and shall assure our heart before him. And whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if the heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. In other words, if you're walking in that peace and rest, see, when you're walking in that peace and rest, you can pray and know. But when your heart's condemning you, you pray and hope. Which is better? Knowing. You have peace. You have rest. You know when you pray, God answers your prayer. And you're walking in peace. Now, sometimes in that prayer, he might say, no, you don't need that just yet or ever what. But God answers prayer. Amen? I know y'all still love me. All right, look in Galatians. If then you have been raised, you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, and set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality. See, we've got to die to these things. Dead to immorality, impurity, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is on account of these things that the wrath of God will come. So if I won't turn from, say, being angry at my neighbor, what's going to happen? The anger of the Lord is going to be on me, right? Is that what this is saying? See? John 3.36, which is saying the same thing as John 3.16. It says, He who believes in his Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That word believe in our language is kind of an intellectual knowledge, but in this language it embraces and it's wrapped around the word obedience. He who believes is he who obeys the Son. All right, let's go back. We looked at the New Testament, and we could spend all day just in the New Testament. It says the same things continuously, every book, over and over and over. But in Deuteronomy 28.1, the Lord come down. He said, and it shall be, if you will diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments with which I command you today, the Lord your God will sit you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you will do what? Obey the Lord your God. So in other words, you won't have to chase blessings, church. They'll chase you. I'm going to tell you how blessed I was this week. I got four pies, two sacks of bread, two ranches, and about 12 paintings. I told Eric, I said, you know, maybe one of these days I'll get a little money to put in the bank. But boy, I sure got a bunch of stuff this week. Just one, just one of them ranches is like this. I give it to Jason. It's found on the side of the road. But you know, just, just blessed in spite of me. So if you need any pies, you know what? Okay. But it said, if you obey the Lord, right? Now look at verse 15. 
Well, let me ask you a question. Is God faithful? Will he do what he says he'll do? He does, doesn't he? If he says, if you obey me, and obeying him, you look in the New Testament, it's just simply love God with all your heart, mind, and body, and love your neighbor as you say. There ain't a bunch of do's and don'ts. God's law given to mankind was not meant to restrict man, it was meant to protect him. See, it protects us. When we walk outside the boundaries, we lose our protection. Now, let's look in verse 15. But it shall come about if you will not obey the Lord your God, deserve to do all his commandments and statutes which I charge you today, all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. So do you think God's faithful in that too? Now, we're going to go through a little list here in just a minute, and you're going to say, man, God does what he says he'll do. Because we're seeing it in our own lives. See, Brother Chet talking about the good King Josiah right there again this morning where they were having revival. And they found in the midst of rebuilding the church, so to speak, they found the book of the law that had been lost in the house of the Lord. And they brought it and they read it to him and he ripped his clothes and he said, Go and inquire of the Lord if the anger of God is upon us all. And see, there was great repentance there. And you know what happened after great repentance? Great revival. All the way through the scriptures. When man gets proud and puffed up, he loses the book of the law. And God in his faithfulness always seems to over and over bring, surface it back to his church. Because the book of the law has been lost in the house of the Lord. You would think it had been lost up the street somewhere, but it's been lost right in the middle of us. See? So, all right, we'll just go through a little bit. Some of the things that's under the curse of the law. Now, this is, you now when it says the word curse, a lot of times we kind of think about uh, uh, sticking a pen in a doll or something like that, you know, witchcraft. But actually, the word really means the consequences for your actions. Now, the consequences for obedience is what? Blessings. The consequences for disobedience is what? Curses. So let's look at some of the curses. The Lord will send upon you curses. Confusion. There's one. Do we see confusion in the church today? Is it supposed to be there? Now, see, theologically speaking, I, I was teaching this one up in Springfield about three months ago, and, and I said, theologically speaking, this is not here. And it's kind of like this uh, coffee table that I'm sitting here looking at. Theologically speaking, that coffee table's not there, but I'm seeing a coffee table. And see, anybody can read God's Word. It says, it's, and our theologians tell us, this is not supposed to be here, but yet I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it with my own eye. I'm seeing confusion. Let's look at some of the other. Uh and rebuking all that you undertake to do until you're destroyed, until you perish quickly on account of the evil of the deeds, because you have forsaken me. The Lord will make pestilence clean to you, diseases clean to you. Uh, you shall grope at noon as a blind man gropes in darkness, and you shall not prosper in your ways, but you shall only be oppressed and robbed continually for none to save you. You shall patrol a wife, and another man shall violate her. Have you ever heard of divorce? You know, in 1895, I had a magazine. You know what the divorce rate was in 1895 in this country? Six out of a thousand. In 1925, 30 years later, you know what it had risen to? They were alarmed. Twelve out of a thousand. You know what it is today? Real close to 600 out of a thousand. According to what I'm reading here, it's not supposed to be here. It's part of the consequences of breaking God's law. Deuteronomy 28:38, you shall bring out much seed to the field, but you shall gather in little, for the locusts shall consume it. You shall plant and cultivate vineyards, but you shall neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall devour them. And it goes down, look at verse 43. The alien who is among you shall rise above you higher and higher, but you shall go down lower and lower. He shall lend to you, but you shall not lend to him, and he shall be the head, and you shall 
be the tail. And, and in this country, when we emerged out of World War II, there was not one product you can name where we wasn't number one in hardly. Because in, in a, a period of time, we have forsaken the Lord. We were the world's lender nation. Now we're the world's deborah nation. Everything in one generation is flipped. We're almost the bottom of the stack in education, engineering, just about everything you name. But at one time, we were at the top of the stack. What's the difference? We kick, you know, kick God out of the school. We kicked him out of everything. That's as a nation. Same thing can happen in our families. We're going to look at that in a minute. You know? So the alien or the Chinese comes in and he rises higher and higher and we go lower and lower. Does that happen? You, you see what I'm talking about? <coughs> then the Lord will bring extraordinary plagues on you and your descendants, even severe and lasting plagues and miserable and chronic sicknesses. And he will bring back on you all the diseases of Egypt, which you were afraid, and they shall cling to you. Every sickness and every plague, which not written in the book of the law, the Lord will bring unto you are destroyed. So your life shall hang in doubt before you, and you shall be in dread day and night, and you shall have no assurance of your life. In the morning you shall say would it, that it were evening, and at the evening you shall say would it be morning, because of the dread of your heart which you dread, and for the sight of your eyes which you see. And the Lord will bring you back to Egypt in ships by way which about I spoke to you, that you'll never see it again, and there you shall offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as the male and female slaves, but there will be no buyer. It, it, talking about, do we see sickness and extraordinary things? I, I'm talking about in the church. Do we see it in the church? You think that might be a problem? See? But see, we, we, we thought we're in one place, and ex, actually we've been somewhere else. Uh, it says there shall be no bearing, uh, miscarrying or bearing in your land, I will fill the number of your days. In Leviticus it says, uh, I will in turn do this to you. I will appoint over you sudden terror, consumption and fever shall waste away the eyes and call the soul to pine away. And also you shall sow your seed use for your enemies shall eat it up. And I will set my face against you so that you shall be struck down before your enemies. And those who hate you shall rule over you. Now, see, in this context, you think it's the Philistines or the Chaldeans. We're talking about spiritual things right here. In other words, that spiritual enemy of the devil or the powers of darkness are going to rule over you. And they're going to rule over you. They can, anger can rule over you. Lust can rule over you. Addictions can rule over you. Fear can rule over you. You, you see what I'm talking about? Your enemy rules over you. God says, if you obey me, you'll rule over him. You can tell him to take a hike. Do we see that amongst us today? Do we? We do, don't we? See? Now, to go through all that, I just want to go kind of sum it up. And there's a lot more here. It just... Uh, uh, and here's the supporting scripture, but curse the law. Disobedience is confusion. We said we've seen that. We've seen confusion, mental and emotional breakdown. Do we see that? We can't build enough mental hospitals, enough prisons today. You know that? Okay. Uh, divorce and breakdown of family. Do we see that? See, the destruction. Poverty. Chronic sicknesses, anxiety, worry, dread, and fear, accident prone, violent death, spiritual darkness, miscarriages, and a barren wound. Now, church, we must ask ourselves, is that amongst us? Is it? Well, can we say the anger of the Lord is upon us all like the good King Josiah said? Can we see that? We said we oh how I love Jesus, but something's wrong. We need to look at this. Something is wrong somewhere. Has a holy God missed something or have we? It's we have. And see, and, and what the Lord is saying to us is repent. Now, in part of the Ten Commandments, 
which never gets read. And he's talking about other gods. You shall not worship them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations, those that hate me. And Psalm says those that hate the Lord is those that pretend obedience to him. He'd rather you be on the other side of the fence than straddling the fence, saying, oh, how I love Jesus, and acting, you know, you go out in this world. That, that, so when you hate the Lord, you pretend obedience to him. But what he said, my sins are going to pass to my children. And when we see the same sin, it goes from grandfather to father to daddy to me and my children and my grand. When you just see the same sin, whether it be stubbornness or whether it be anger, you know, we have these acceptable sins. Like the stubborn, like Brother Chet was talking about, said in his family, said if you want to look up the word stubborn, there'd be a picture of a moral there. Well, I got news for you. The dictionary would be full of pictures. There'd be a carpenter there. I guarantee you. Or maybe a green or two, since he did like this. But, but do you see what, you see what I'm talking about? And, and, and we have, I was teaching this a few weeks ago, and a beautiful thing happened. I had a grandmother there, and I wish this lady went to this church, because all you'd have to just get up and read something and she'd run up front. I, I'd never seen such a humble woman before the Lord. And God's doing something in her life. I, I mean, there is miracle after miracle. And, and I was teaching on this, on, on, and we'll get there in just a second, about illegitimacy. And she said, she just, boy, I had a child out of wedlock. My daughter had a child out of wedlock. And my granddaughters had a child out of wedlock. And all three of them repented together. I've never had that happen before. A curse was broken in that family that had been going for three generations. See? So, all right, and then we get to uh, Deuteronomy 23, 2. No one of illegitimate birth shall enter the sin of the Lord. None of his descendants, even to the tenth generation, shall enter the sin of the Lord. So there's a ten-generational curse. What you do affects your house ten generations. Do you know that? If you don't deal with it. If you say, I'm not going there, it's going to keep trucking. If you say, Lord, I, my house is repenting, and we'll see that in just a second, he can stop it. Now, <clears throat> if you won't believe the Bible, this is some material that I've got that when Congress was doing uh, effects on welfare reform, this was done, uh, the Committee of Ways and Means, United States House of Representatives, trying to just, trying to discover what what's this deal about all the poverty and, and everything that they are having to pay for, and, you know, that's trying to cut welfare reform. So they did a study. They, they Everything they do, they do a study. And it ended up being a pretty good study. I almost think they didn't use it. In the study, it says, it says, thus the absence of marriage increases the frequency of child poverty 700%. However, marriage after illegitimate, uh, illegitimate birth is relative effective cutting the child poverty in half. So in other words, uh, the difference between an illegitimate child and a legitimate child 700%. Same economic conditions. See? Uh, it just goes into a bunch of stuff here. It says, children raised by never married mothers have significantly more behavior problems. When compared to children raised by both biological parents, when comparisons made between families that are identical in race, income, number of children, and mother's education, behavioral differences between illegitimate and legitimate children actually widen. Compared to children living with both biological parents in similar social economic circumstances, children of never married mothers have three times more behavioral problems than children raised in comparable intact families. Children born out of wedlock have less ability to delay gratification and poor impulse control over anger and sexual gratification. They have a weaker sense of conscience or a sense of right and wrong. I'm just trying to go through just a few of the highlights, but one of the 
the one that really jumped off the page to me. It says, perhaps the worst feature of illegitimacy is that it is passed like a virus between generations. Children born outside of marriage themselves are three times more likely to be on welfare when they grow up. Illegitimacy is a major factor in America's crime problem. Lack of married parents rather than race. Or poverty is pr the principal factor in crime rates. It's been known for some time that high rates of welfare dependency and correlate with high crime rates among young men in the neighborhood. Everything God said in the book of Deuteronomy is what you're reading right here in the real world. And then in uh, these statistics, and each one of them has where it come from, 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. Now, this covers illegitimacy and fatherless homes. It covers the breakup of the family. 90% uh, of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. 85% of all children that exhibit behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. 80% of rapists motivated with displaced anger come from fatherless homes. 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 75% of all adolescent Patients in chemical abuse centers come from fatherless homes. 70% of juveniles in state-operated institutions come from fatherless homes. 85% of all youth sitting in prisons grew up in a fatherless home. 85%. One day up to Sumner County Jail, there was 100, and the maximum at that jail was 150 prisoners. And I asked the, the deputy up there, if you took drugs and alcohol out of here, how many prisoners would you have in this jail? And he looked at his list. Some of them are in, in there because they robbed some four drugs. He said, I may have four or five. So you see what is happening to society? Society's going this way. The breakdown, some of us older people know we come from a world that's not even kin to the world we live in today. When I was a kid, I could ride a bicycle from East Nashville all the way to the YMCA. Ain't nobody felt nothing about it. Nobody bothered anybody. I wouldn't dare let my child do that today when he's 10 or 12 years old. You know, we just, a total different society of what, what has happened. Now look at the rest of these statistics. They're five times more likely to commit suicide, 32 times more likely to run away, 20 times more likely to have behavioral disorders, 14 times more likely to commit rape, Nine times more likely to drop out of high school and ten times more likely to abuse chemical substances. Nine times more likely to end up in a state-operated institution and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. So you don't think the consequences of disobedience is not on society? Big time, isn't it? Now, the Lord... Well, let me just get this. Here's a chart of two different people. And I've got a, a real thick file on different things here, but this just kind of sums it up. Jonathan Edwards, one of America's greatest theologians, he was the leader of the Great Awakening, which happened in the uh, 17th century. Out of his 1,334 descendants, he had 13 college presidents, 65 college professors, 100 lawyers, 30 judges, a dean of an outstanding law school, 66 physicians, dean of a medical school, 80 in public office, three U.S. senators, three mayors of large cities, three governors, one control of the U.S. Treasury, and one vice president in the United States. That is one blessed rascal, wasn't he? 1,335. Now, now you think, you remember what it says on the law, if you obey me, you'll be the head, and not the tail? These folks were heads, wasn't they? See? Because of one man's obedience. Look what the Lord did. Now here's another fellow. Started in 1720. This study was to 1,200 known descendants, and I've got a lot of more material on this Jude family. Uh, given to an emperor who settled in upstate New York in 1720, known to have cost the state of New York in excess of one million in welfare, prison, prison and custodial charges. He had a fling somewhere around the Revolutionary War and produced an illegitimate child. His whole nature of his family turned from there. But out of these 1,200 descendants, now you got to realize this wording comes from the last century, but it says 1,310 professional paupers. Do we have any among us today? See, 
440 physically wrecked, 130 convicted criminals, 60 thieves, 55 victims of gross immorality, of what that means, 7 murders, only 20 ever learned to trade, and 10 of those did so in prison. No trace of godlessness. 1,200 descendants. 10. 20 learned to trade, and 10 did from prison. Now, it, which family's blessed? See, is God faithful? And, and He's not faithful when you obey, is He not? Is He faithful when we disobey? He is, isn't He? Now, now I, I kind of got you in trouble, hadn't I? I got to get you out. Amen? All right, in Leviticus 2640, it says, now the book, the 26th chapter of Leviticus goes through and said, if they don't obey me, I'm going to increase the plague on them seven times for a sin, and it gets pretty bad. There's some things listed there, and you know these people, if they go through this, they're in a mental institution. I mean, it's just bad, bad. Real bad. And it goes through whole families like this. But at the end of that, to show you God's grace, look what he says. If they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their forefathers in their unfaithfulness which they committed against me and also in their acting with hostility against me, I was acting with hostility against them to bring them into the land of the enemies. The devil's the enemy. You know, we talked about the lust. We talked about the immorality. We talked about, you know, all the things that has affected us and affected our families for generations. Church, our forefathers missed some things. See? And, and uh, <clears throat> to bring you into the land of the enemy with their uncircumcised heart becomes humble so they make amends their iniquity. Then I'll remember my covenant with Jacob. I remember my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham as well, and I remember the land. In other words, God is saying, if you will repent of your sins, recognize your house has sinned against the Lord. Now, when I say your house, I'm talking about you, your daddy, your grandfather. You, you know, what we usually do in deliverance when we get to this point is we deal, we deal with it for ten generations because we do not know what happened nine generations ago. And you'd be surprised at the things that just come out. We was dealing with a lady one night, and we, we hit the ninth generation. She curled up in a fetal position. I mean, it was just showing where that sin come from. Nine generations. See, that's almost 400 years. See, and God has sent a pardon. He sent grace to us. But he's saying, what's he saying do here? Repent. Recognize the sins. He said, I'll heal your land. I'll change from being under the lineage of the Jews to under the lineage of uh, John Fitt Edwards. I'll make your house instead of a curse, make it a bless. And that's what he's saying. I'll flip things around like that woman that night said, hey, I've sinned. My daughter's sinned. My granddaughter sinned. I'm stopping it. Church, the ball's in our court. And that's what God is doing in his grace. All right. In Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from what? He redeemed us from the curse of the law, did he not? See, my question is, if he did, how come it's here? Has he missed something, or have we? So what do we do? We say, Lord, I repent. I turn. I make that declaration. I make that proclamation. Devil, you've had my family long enough. I'm talking about not just you. I'm talking about your family. I'm talking about your brothers, your sisters, your aunts, your uncles. You can see the destruction has been in our families. And we look back generations and see all these things that happen. When Jesus said, he says, Christ redeemed us from the cursed law, having become a curse for us, who is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessings of Abraham might come to Gentile, so that we might receive the promises of the Spirit through faith. He said, Repent. Remember the pardon? Remember George Wilson was stubborn? 
notes and I'm not going there. And the pardon was laying there. Jesus has become a pardon for us at Calvary. Let's pray. Father, I just come to your throne. And Lord, we just ask that you pour out your spirit on us, Lord. Lord, bring us to a place. Bring us to that low place, Lord, to just to see the destruction that's been going on in our house and our families, Lord. Lord, let us see the grace that is in Christ Jesus, Lord. That, Lord, we hadn't been obedient to the Son. Lord, we just said a few words and maybe our four easy steps into heaven. And Lord, when you sang to walk, you said seven times to the seven churches in Revelation that he that overcomes shall inherit. Lord, let us be overcomers. Let us be those, Lord, that follow you. And obey you, Lord. Bring us to a place, Lord. Bring revival in our hearts, Lord. Bring a peace and a rest. Bring us to that place. For we say Jesus Christ is Lord. And you won't have to say, Lord, why do you call me Lord, Lord, not do what I say? Let us be doers of the word, Lord. And not just hears. Cause us, Lord, to walk your way. Lord, I know the cloud's moving, Lord. And Lord, we want to move with it. We want your grace and your presence right in our midst, Lord. Let us prepare that holy place in our hearts for you. Bring the fear of the Lord in our hearts again. Bring us to a place that you can bless us, Lord, that we'll walk with you. And we just ask this in the precious, precious name of Jesus. Amen.